remember the date that you enlisted? Well, I enlisted it. In fact, I was at the University of Oregon. I was in my second year at the University of Oregon. I'd got a scholarship to Oregon. And um, I, see, I was 18 when I graduated from Carleton High School. And I had a four-year scholarship to Linfield uh, because I, I was raised as a Baptist in the First Baptist Church. And how many of you live in, live in the Carleton area? Wowie. Woo. Well, then, <laughs> this is really thrilling for me to get to talk to all of you, but uh, particularly from Carleton. And so I went all 12 years there, and uh, at, uh, in my junior and junior year, I was present to class both years. She told me something they couldn't find anybody else to be president. <laughs> and so uh, I'm on graduation because I'd also received a scholarship to the uh, University of Oregon School of Journalism, uh, basically because uh, we had a very, I'm going to take a minute about Carleton. In high school, we had a, a really an outstanding mimeograph paper, uh, high school paper. And you can't believe it, but in the nation, our talking about the whole nation, we won the top award as the top mimeograph newspaper in the United States. Columbia University in New York School of Journalism uh, awarded us the highest honor. Northwestern School of Journalism in, in Chicago, uh, Everett, uh, the School and School Award to find us. So we were the, had the finest mimeograph, which I have, copies of all four years and, uh, and I'm going to present it to the library at the University of Oregon and so uh, there I had kind of a running start also I had <laughs> this is something I'll never understand but I was I went to the went down to Eugene to the School of Journalism for their annual high school uh, newspaper uh, conference and of all things, here I was, 17, they elected me president. And these were schools from Vincent, uh, Grant, Roosevelt, Salem, Grants Pass, Pendleton. And I can't believe that they would elect somebody from a school of one, 100 to be president. But that, that really helped me get the scholarship, by the way. And so I went to Oregon and I started out in journalism. and. Uh, Basically, in advertising, I I was a day manager selling advertising for the Emerald, which is any of you. Did you go to Oregon? No, my son, my eldest son, graduated from there. Did he? Did I'm you? a beaver, sir. You're a beaver. Yes, okay, sir. I will. I'll be. I'll be really careful <laughs> because I'm very fond of Oregon State because uh, they, they've had their hardships, but it's a great school, and uh, I just I'm glad you told me. <laughs> so anyway, from there we. Um, uh, I went, I was, and I eventually became the day manager. I was a day manager, and then I became the advertising manager of the Emerald as a sophomore, and they paid me $35 a month, which was big money for me. And uh, in December of 41, uh, the Japanese kept, you know, went after Pearl Harbor. And that next spring, I enlisted as a buck private. And, uh, and uh, I, I was able, I'd taken junior ROTC and uh, it, well, that's, they only had two years at that time because the seniors were all, got their second lieutenants and went on to uh, OCS. And so uh, at the end of my sophomore year, I, I joined the Army in, in California at, uh, in my basic training in, uh, in Camp Roberts, 17 weeks, and then I went on to Fort Benning and I got my commission as a second lieutenant. And uh, so does that answer that part of it? Yeah. Well, we'll go through the question again. Uh, the question was, when did you enlist? When I enlisted? Yeah. Well, that's it. <laughs> I guess I, did I cover that all right? Yeah. Questions? <laughs> okay. Um, so can you tell us uh, about your experience during boot camp and training? Well, I was at Fort Benning, and uh, it's a great, it was a, it was a tough course. And, it, you know, we got ready to, I had the good luck at, at Fort Benning of graduating pretty well up in my class. I never felt I was a, I, I, I don't think it, my desire was ever to be a top-notch soldier, because it, 
it was pretty rugged living on a farm all my life and going through all that baloney and uh, at the Benning and uh, but it, once once I graduated that fall the division I I was assigned to was at Fort Benning and so I just went across the street and joined the 71st division and uh, it had trained there at Sand Hill with with uh, as a second lieutenant and I had a a, 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 a mortar platoon first, which is about the lowest second lieutenant in the regiment. And this is really important because I want to tell you how you kind of get known. And when they came around to inspect us in the field, uh, an exercise, uh, a general came, a brigadier general who was a very fine West Point officer. And he observed my training method with the mortar section. And evidently, and I didn't know this at the time, I knew it later, but he gave me the extremely high re high marks above everybody that they, inv they inspected that day. And that, that, I knew I did pretty well because I'd done a good job. But then when we went overseas that winter, uh, they signed me with the mortar sec, I mean, the uh, mine platoon section of the regiment, which is a tough job. It's one of the most dangerous jobs in the regiment. And so we got to France, and uh, I, uh, we were, and once again, I was not overly enthusiastic because of the fact that that was a very dangerous job. And I thought, well, maybe they're going to get rid of me early. <laughs> But anyway, I had the good opportunity there. It was right at uh, right on the French coast. So we they allowed me to start a, a mine training school with my 17 guys, and once again, uh, it excelled. It was, I got very, very high marks. And so, at that time, the Germans were starting to retreat out of uh, out of the Normandy beachhead and. Uh, so we we really didn't run much combat, but we took a lot of mines out. We didn't run into many. We we went across France, and the Germans had set up a line called the well. There was the Siegfried Line and the Maginot Line, and in 1922, right after World War One, the French put up a, a, a mine field called the Maginot Line, and it was dead by the time we were there in 1944. And so we got through that, and the Siegfried Line was only, it was built in about 1938, just before the war started, and uh, it was dangerous. And so once we got through those two, we got down to the Rhine River. Uh, there was really not anything for me to do. I mean, we had to look for minefields, but there weren't minefields. So anyway, I became a reconnaissance platoon leader, which is even, even more dangerous. And so we went across the... See, how many are you here? Is there 14 of you? Is there 14 of you? I ended up with a 16, 16 in my squad, in my platoon, uh, in my reconnaissance. At, at that point, uh, that's a very dangerous job, and I'll kind of give you an idea. Uh, when, you're in, when you're on the offensive, which we were at that time, the Germans were retreating, uh, every day uh, we would attack, and. Uh, one of my jobs would be about, I'd find out about 12 or 1 o'clock in the morning what the, the regimental commander wanted me to do. I'm going to stop here again. We had a, a division commander that was a West Pointer. We had a uh, assistant division commander, a West Pointer, the guy that I said had seen me at, uh, with my mortar section. Uh, the uh, artillery commander was a West Pointer. All three of the regimental commanders were West Pointers. So I was blessed at that time to have the very finest leadership there was possibly could have. They were just, I couldn't have asked for anything. And all at once I started to wake up that we were, you know, we, we had a dangerous job. And every night, as I said, about midnight or one o'clock in the morning, I'd get orders for the next day. <laughs> and. Um, and he'd come to me and he said, well, Jim, I think what we're going to do this day, we've got, we're going to do this attacking, and I want you to go out about 15 or 20 minutes early and, uh, and with, your, with your troops and see if you get fired upon, okay? And so that's not a very good mission, but so I would go out, and we would go out until we got fired upon. 
and I'd call back and I'd say, well, we we found the enemy. Uh, what do you want me to do? Well, Jim, uh, we think you ought to keep going. Uh, it's up to you, but it, we, we think they're just trying to slow you down. I thought, crap. <laughs> and so uh, basically, and I think the point I'm going to make here is probably the most important point that I'm going to make in this talk. My philosophy on leading that group was to protect the lives of my 16 guys first. And then we would kill the enemy at the opportunity. And I want to tell you, that saves a lot of lives instead of being there. The one purpose is to kill the enemy. Not me. I was going to save all of you. And it paid off. It paid off the only way. And that's, if I, I made it one point, it was, it was the soldiers, and, and it, it was very what right thing to do, and I'll give you an example a little bit. But anyway, uh, we proceeded, and, uh, and we'd run into skirmishes because the Germans were retreating that time. And uh, we were supposed to head for Berlin, but the British on the left uh, were coming in, and so they were moving up to the Elbe River in, uh, in, in, uh, in Germany. And so they changed our direction to Czechoslovakia, and then they, we got <laughs> to Czechoslovakia, and then they changed it to go towards Austria. And we went south. And um, by that time, the Germans were retreating. And um, so uh, I was given the mission, which I don't understand uh, the regimental commander picking me. But he said, well, Jim, uh, let's, I'm going to go back for a minute on the, on the Nazis. Uh, Hitler took over in 32, 1932, and it was right after Russia had collapsed in 1917. Little history here. And so Hitler, he thought he had a lot of power and he was made the head guy of Germany. He was the head guy of everything. And so he decided he was gonna build the German race up because they'd been kind of beaten around as a result of World War I. And am I taking, I'm taking too much time. <laughs> but anyway, um, he, uh, he decided that that all the land had been taken away from me in World War I. A lot of you professors already know this, but I'll go through it again. That basically he wanted it back. And so the, the, the easiest one was in, well, the first I want to stop, that was 32. In, in 1936 was the Olympics. And as you know, he put on a great show in uh, Berlin and down, and it, they also had the Winter Olympics. And so he put on a great show, but it, it didn't, they didn't, nobody caught, caught on at what he was going to do. And so right after that, in 1937, he took over the Sudetenland, which is next to France. And basically, most of the people there were Germans, so it was easy to acquire that property back. And then it was in two years, he took over Czechoslovakia, as you recall. And then... The next year, he took Austria, you know, annexed them all, and the, and the British and the French. Uh, and at the meantime, Italy had declared war against us and because they'd gone into North Africa, as you recall. And so it was a situation where, um, where the French and the British did not do anything, as you know, and so uh, Hitler still had a free hand, so they say he went to Austria, so he he got all that property. And at that time in 1939, I think it was in September, he also invaded uh, Poland, as you recall. And uh, that was, a, 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 a well, he did it, and uh, not going into the details of that one. But anyway, at that time I was right right at the edge of Austria. And uh, with my 16 guys, <laughs> and I never will understand why the regimental commander said, well, Jim, he said, I want you to take off with a 16 guy, two half tracks and a Jeep. And I want you to try to get to Vienna there before the Russians. I thought, well, okay, you know. And so it was, uh, we took off. And so now I'm going to get into some kind of details of uh, saving lives and so on. Um, and so we, we got going and we ran into skirmishes uh, and the other thing, same, same deal, we'll have people behind you to support you if you get in trouble. 
and basically when I got in trouble before I would get the tanks to come up and support me me and my 16 guys or artillery but I always had a battalion which is about 4,000 to back you up so in this case we took off and uh, it was it was a long day you know about 10 hours by the time we got through combat and as we got closer to uh, to Vienna uh, they the um, they started to put all the troops brought down from Berlin to support Hitler's escape to Berchtesgaden, where he was planning to escape. I mean, just you know, if he if, if we won, and so we got there, and the first thing I ran into was a kind of a deal which I never, I never. Uh, well, all I can say is we got to a point where we saw the enemy, and uh, and I was on high ground. And my 16 guys, I want to tell you how great they were. They started firing at these, at these uh, SS troops, and they were the finest troops that, that Germany had, the German SSers. And they, they just killed them, killed them. And uh, so um, I never, I didn't know how many, when you fight a, a battle and you kill people, you don't know how many you've killed because you're going on to the next mission. And so I, um, I'm taking too long to answer your question, but it just got, probably goes together. And uh, so anyway, uh, at that point, uh, I had to make a decision. We were supposed to get to Vienna, and uh, we'd wiped out this. I didn't know how many, but I found out 50 years later that we'd killed 31. We killed 31 in that ambush, and I didn't lose a soul. Now, that's what I'm talking about is not losing a soul and so then I I took a calculated risk which is generally it was the same thing as I went back on those initial reconnaissance you just they're just trying to slow you down to keep going Jim and so I said well let's go on there's a little town there let's go into this town <laughs> so we went into this town and here is a SS battalion yes sorry do you know the name of the town that you went in Horbach. What was it? H-O-R-B-A-C-H. H-O-R-B-A-C. The reason I've been there with my son. We went back to the site, so we know the site. And so we went in there and we ran into it. It wasn't an ambush. It was a, they, they, there, was S, there was a whole battalion. I didn't know there was a whole battalion there with this SS major. And he said to my sergeant, who spoke a little German, he says, well, uh, I want to talk to the commander, and he said, "Well, pointed me a second lieutenant." So I, um, <laughs> I uh, talked to him, and he said, uh, "I said, I, we want you all to surrender." He said, "No, I, 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 I'm under orders. I won't surrender unless I kill myself and you, me. Here you are. You're surrounded, and we didn't know we were surrounded by 800. We knew they were, we were some. We knew we were in damn bad trouble." And of the 16 guys, four of them got on each side of me. And one of my sergeants found a lanyard around his neck and cut it, threw it, and it went off. It would have killed us. It would have killed me. That's how close I became to be killed at that occasion. And so uh, basically, then he was furious. And I said, well, I'm, he said, I'm gonna kill you, kill all six of you. I said, I'm gonna burn your town down. <laughs> I was pretty bright <laughs> and so basically then the battalion came up and I didn't realize that we you know captured 800 and so it was a big victory for me and uh, when we went back uh, 50 years later we went to the point where we killed the ambush people and they had a huge cross and I have pictures with my son that we'd killed 31 and so anyway at that point uh, <laughs> well, we got our tail bailed out without getting killed, but that's how close I came to being killed and how close my soldiers did too, but uh, basically it was to save them that I would rather give my life than to lose them. And so then we went on, and uh, this was a, probably the victory that, I, don't, I wouldn't call it a victory, but where I got the most fame. And I got the Silver Star, I think, for that uh, operation. And so we 
Oh, the, the regimental commander said, I want you to go out, Jim. Uh, we think there's a big ammunition dump someplace that these troops from Germany and Poland that are coming down uh, to, to, to guard uh, Hitler at Versus Garden. And so we went out there and we looked around. And at that time, the maps were terrible. You didn't know anything what was going on. And, and I was frankly about ready to give up. And my sergeant said, let's look, take a look over here in this forest. So we went over and it was a, <clears throat> well, there was 3,000 lying dead from starvation and disease. You know, I didn't, but you didn't know there was three, until later I found that out. People were starving to death. And I'll have to give you a little background on how this came about. Towards the end of the war, uh, all the Jews um, uh, were pretty well surrounded, but the last Jews in Budapest were the doctors, the professional people that supported uh, Budapest. And in the winter of 45, they marched them from Budapest to Linz, Germany. There was a huge concentration camp at Linz called Mauthausen. It was up on a bridge. And when they got there, uh, they, they couldn't accept them because they had 120,000 prisoners already in that Mauthausen complex. So what they had to do, they had to send these prisoners uh, someplace. So they set up little satellite camps. And this is, say, around Christmas or so. And so they had to send these Hungarian Jews down to Gunskirchen Lager, where, where, we, where we found them. And in the middle of winter, and more of them died from starvation and disease. And they got down there, and this was not a concentration camp. This was a death camp because they, they didn't have any food or anything. They had Austrian, Austrian guards. And so, to make a long story short, there was 3,000 dead, and we captured 15,000 Hungarian Jews and freed them. That was the greatest victory I had, that me and my 16 guys. And of course, afterwards, you don't know how many you captured or how many was dead. It was people that came in afterwards. I remember, uh, we didn't know what to do. Uh, they'd come up on your boots and you gave them food see rashes, they die, choked immediately. You know, on 16 guys, that's pretty effective. God, really, even today. So anyway, I, I know I'm a little bit dramatic, but I think it, to, to get the story across, uh, I think that's what you're here for, <laughs> is to find out about some things in World War II. And so at that time, uh, we, and, and I'm gonna take one other point. It hung with me for about 50 years, but the Holocaust Council uh, in New York wanted to come back and take, to go back to the site of this sort of thing. And so the, all the survivors of the families that died in the camp uh, were going to be there in, in Vienna. And so I um, didn't want to go. It was, it was near November 11th, uh, Veterans Day, and I just, every excuse I could think of, I just, I detested what we'd run into so bad, I just, I just can't go back. Well, anyway, they convinced me to go back, and it was a good thing I went, uh, because uh, I went to Vienna, and, uh, and they were all there, and we went, we went to Mauthausen, but while I was at the airport waiting to go to Mauthausen, the concentration camp, a guy came up to me and he says, you're Jim Thayer? And I said, yes. And he says, why don't you know Jim Thayer, if you hadn't come in when you did, I'd have died within 24 hours. I knew it's Wolf Finkelman. I would have died within 24 hours. I was 14 years old. Completely changed my attitude on killing people because of the fact that it vindicated me on the killing of the 31 in that ambush. So these are the things that really affect your life, the rest of your life. But that event there at the airport really changed my life. That we did, we saved six million Jews, possibly. Sh shut up, Jim. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so earlier, did you say that you went to OCS? What? Earlier, did you say? You I, went to I went to Officers Candidate School and. Uh, 
and it was a 17-week school. It was, it was, if you went now as a ranger or anything, the training you'd get right now is far, far harder than than we had to go through, because 17 weeks it was, it was in the infancy of, of putting the army together, and so it was a. Yeah, but it was at Fort Benning, and uh, I've been back there a number of times. I've been honored there. I'm in the Hall of Fame there. And uh, what more can you say? I, I think I'm boring you. <laughs> next question. Next question. <laughs> next question. Um, so did you uh, get any injuries when you were overseas? That's what I say. I protected my soldiers. Okay. That was my number one priority, and it paid off. Okay, I got killed first. <laughs> okay, go ahead. What did you do um, after World War II? Well, after the war, I came back and I made a good decision. I joined the Army Reserve and uh, active reserve. They some of them came back, went into the inactive reserve. And then five years after World War II was over, Korea started, and um, they took all the inactive reserve. Terrible, they were untrained. And that's when I was in the 104th Division, where I eventually was offered the job as division commander. And um, so I, I went in, I, I came out of the war as a captain, which is, I was a pretty young, 23-year-old captain, because I'd done a good job, they promoted me those West Pointers promoted me fast. Because <laughs> John Eisenhower, by the way, was in our regiment, the president's son. He was a great friend of mine. I saw him afterwards. But anyway, uh, that was, uh, what was the question again? What did you do after? Oh, okay. I came back and stayed in the active reserve, 104th Division. And uh, I'm not, there's a little interim there that was probably most significant uh, in my life because at that time it, I went back to, I graduated in 47, I went back and worked on my graduate degree and it was the spring of the 1948 political campaign between Dewey and Stassen here in Oregon and uh, one of my fraternity brothers uh, was uh, head of the, the Stassen campaign for Oregon and he made me in charge of college work. And so I had the real opportunity to meet Harold Stassen and go to the debates with Dewey and so on. And anyway, I, I went through that and I became the young, re uh, I became the National Committeeman for the Young Republicans of Oregon. <laughs> and I'm gonna, this is really a great story. <laughs> if you don't mind, another 15, 20 minutes. And so uh, <laughs> I shouldn't tell a bunch of people like you this, but. The night before, in the convention, the first night, uh, Tom McCall became governor of Oregon, and he had a, this is before he became governor, and he had a friend that he wanted to make the president, and Tom McCall and I were good friends. I liked him a lot. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't even tell you, this is a terrible story, but uh, I, was, I was 27 then, and uh, so we, the night before the, elect, the, the, the convention, a lot of my buddies were drinking at the bar, Data said, Jim, we're gonna nominate you for president. <laughs> and the momentum started. And I liked the other guy. I thought he was, he was, but I was just thrilled with him. And so uh, it, there was so much momentum for me. All my friends went to play golf and they moved the election up a day. <laughs> so because all my friends would be up, they were, wouldn't be there to vote. And when the election day came up, it was a tie vote between me and, uh, and Freeman Holman, who was a wonderful guy, and Tom McCall, who later became governor selected Freeman. Best decision that ever happened to me. <laughs> was a, that, 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 I, it, was a, it was great. But in the meantime, I did get some good political experience that I didn't want to do the rest of my life. Uh, during that campaign, uh, uh, the National Republican Convention was, uh, the National Republican Convention was in Philadelphia. And so anyway, um, uh, I went there and of all things, they gave me the opportunity to be assistant sergeant arms in charge of the speaker's platform for the convention. And at that particular uh, convention, uh, uh, 
all the people there, Skinny Wainwright of the Philippines and MacArthur and everybody was there. To, so I got to, I was up on the speaker's platform and it was the first convention that was televised. And so here is Jim up there on the uh, speaker's platform uh, with all the high rulers. But anyway, it was a great, it was a great opportunity to uh, find out what I didn't want to do the rest of my life was in politics. So, so much for that. So where are we? Oh, okay, yeah, I got through that. And then one of the guys that was very wealthy had given a lot of money to the Dewey campaign. And uh, this isn't very important, but anyway, I was selected that I should go around and collect money from all these people that had said they'd support Dewey. And of course, Dewey got beat, you know, uh, Dewey got beat and Truman won, big victory. And so the next morning after that, uh, they said, uh, Jim, I want you to go upstairs. John Higgins is a big contributor and uh, see, what he, see if he wants to give you a check, even though the assassin lost. So I went up there and John Higgins, they, I went in there and he handed me the check and he says, uh, Jim Thayer, and this is something that made me feel that I really amounted to something. He said, uh, Jim Thayer, I, I, I thought that I, if, if Dewey had been elected, and Dewey had already selected certain people like the President of North American Aviation to be ambassador to St. James in London, he said, I was going to be the new Secretary of Commerce and I was going to take you as my assistant. That's how close I came to be in Washington and get in, into that Washington bunch. So much, so much for this, the political campaign. And then I had to have a job, so I finally got a job selling tractors, Caterpillar tractors. And I went to the Dalles and uh, did, I didn't think I did very well, but it, it does bring up a point I want to tell you that if you do a good job, it pays off. And so I, I did that for six years and I met my wife there and I was very much in love with her and she was teaching school in Seattle, so we had to commute back and forth. And so I quit my job, <laughs> and Pat and I got married the, the, the day after Easter. And we were Episcopalians, and uh, basically our priest would marry us during Lent. So we had to wait till the day after Easter. And at that time, Caterpillar evidently thought I did a good job. At 31, they offered me a million dollars if I would take the franchise, Caterpillar franchise, in Northern California. But that just shows you if you do a good job, how people come back to you and say, and that's the reason I'm telling all of you students that if you just think of other people all the time instead of yourself, it just falls into place. And so, so much for that. And then Pat and I got married, and of course that, I don't know how much you know about that story, but Pat and I got married, and, and this is an important thing. This document I gave you. Do we have any extra doc? Give it to these two people. Yeah, yeah, yeah give, give, them, oh, give them a copy. This is a, a deal. Uh, don't let the title it's the U.S. Army to the Kiss Army, which <laughs> I'll tell more about that later. But anyway, Pat and I got married, and nine months later, uh, we had the opportunity to go to an organization uh, by Bishop Dagwell of the Episcopal Church in Beaverton. And so Pat and I got very interested. I became the junior warden and at great churches. I'm the only founder that's still alive and it's one of the great churches. And I think one of the things on this document I gave you, the one thing I want you to look at is the last either the sentence or paragraph that the reason I'm successful. The last sentence. Do the second. Read it. Corey, you read it. Oh, you don't have any left, okay. But anyway, the, the main reason that I have been a, a degree of success is because of God. God carrying me. As I said, the first thing in my life is important is God. The second thing is the family. The third thing is the business, which has been quite successful. And the fourth thing is military. The military is the lowest priority I have. I'm a citizen soldier. And to me, that's more than anything I could possibly say that, that made me a success. Next question.
bored you enough. <laughs> you ladies have been pretty quiet. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Go ahead. So during the Korean War, what did you do? Well, I was the intelligence officer for the 104th Division. And as I say, the reason we didn't get uh, called is because they were holding our division here in the United States to go to back to Germany in case in case um, uh, uh, Germany invaded France through the Foley Gap. And so they kept our division fully intact and that's the one that I was offered the job as uh, I was offered the job as uh, Div division commander and, and we were still intact during Vietnam. And by that time I'd graduated from the gra uh, the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. I'd graduated and also from the Armed Forces Staff College at uh, Fort. I've gone a lot, went to a lot of schools. And so I was well prepared to, to do whatever I had to do. But uh, by that time I was almost at retirement age. Another question? Um, so during Korea, what, what exactly like did you all do? Well, all, all we did was basically uh, train to go to, to, to Germany. Okay. I mean, we had to be prepared. In the, in the reserve, you had troops scattered, Seattle, Spokane, the 104th Division. So, uh, well, eventually, I, I actually had a job as assistant uh, operations officer besides intelligence, and I was a personnel. So I, had a, I was well-rounded to be a general. I had a good experience, and I had all the experience at uh, CGNS, Command General Staff, and at Armed Forces. So I was, I was well educated, and this is, this is. <laughs> I never thought I was very bright. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe that's the reason I did well. <laughs> I never thought I was very bright. Do you have any questions? My guest. Oh, oh, myself. Um, um, General Thayer. My name is Hugh Cheney. This is my wife, Kristen Cheney. Yes. My dad was a Navy pilot on the Intrepid. Oh, boy. Uh, a little Corsair and a P-38. Uh -huh. And so um, we've been following what you um, students are doing here at the high school. And I think it's so wonderful to archive these, these men and women of World War II. It's just incredible. So... I've been kind of following you guys, so job well done, really. You see how it affects the community? Yes, sir. You see how it affects the community? I'm glad you, did I plan on you coming in at this time? <laughs> well, uh, sort of, we, we were late and I apologize for that. I've been, are you Mark? I am, no, he's Mark. Oh, Mark, so, okay. Um, my husband is working with um, uh, a monk at the, at the Abbey oh. in Carlton. Oh, yes. He's also going to be interviewed. And um, so my husband told me about that. And Lori works in, Lori McAfee works in the restaurant where you go. Isn't that something? She had told me about you. And so I thought, oh, perfect. Lori, you mean Lori? Mm -hmm. Lori, yeah. Yeah, she's dynamite. <laughs> she's got, she's got, she's got uh, four daughters, all, all women. Yes. <laughs> yes. No, she she, she is damn good. Well, thank you for coming because I heard about you, oh, and, uh, thank you. And, and 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 for the Stafford, we've been to the Abbey. In yeah, fact, I bought okay. your I bought your fudge. <laughs> <laughs> I don't work there. I'm not a monk. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> really? <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, thank you for your comments. Both you thank you. And thank you for your service. Well, it, you know, it, uh, as I say, it, it is a, I want to be known as a citizen soldier that basically anything I've done for God has been because he's carried me since I retired from the military. And that's the reason I made that strong statement at the end of this, uh, this treatise that, uh, by the way, uh, uh, you know, I, I happen to be the, uh, the um, 2005 alumnus a year at the University of Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> so I, they make mistakes all the time. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I put that in there because it, it was the, the alumni magazine printed this. And it's also on in, on the TV. 
General Thayer, may I ask you a question, sir? Huh? May I ask you a question? Uh, yes, please. Uh, when, when, and during my, my military career, which is which is uh, let's see, long over, I was stationed in Germany, and I was stationed in Nuremberg in a little town called Schwabach. I know. Did you spend any time in that area? I went to the Nuremberg trials. Oh wow! Oh, for for, for Goring, I was at I was at the trials. Is that a fact? Yeah, they sent me the trials. John Eisenhower. I had a chance to, to, to tour the, the, the courtroom yeah. when, I was, when I was stationed yeah. there as a soldier myself, so that's amazing. Well, I've had a lot of opportunities uh, all along, and and I, you know, I've had the opportunity to meet the Pope uh, in the military when I was a captain, and uh, he, he honored me, and uh, and so I met a number of prime ministers. Okay, the other, okay, I'll get to the last one in a minute. Go ahead. Any qu another question? Uh, what all can you explain the Nuremberg trials that huh? you saw? What? Can you explain your experience at the Nuremberg trials? Well, basically, I was just a guest. No, I didn't. I didn't participate. There was a guy, another attorney, his name was Thayer. It made a little difference. <laughs> yeah. No, I can't answer that. It's a beautiful city. Hmm? Nuremberg is a beautiful city. I'm sure it looked much different. Well, it really is. It, uh, I spent an hour, I mean, a year in uh, after the war, and that's when I became a company commander so young. And uh, and no, it's. I've been back to to uh, Austria, I think. Well, okay, let me give you one other opportunity I've had. Um, somewhere along the line, I really wanted to, uh, you know, kind of. I didn't. You know, I kind of forgot about the military, but Secretary of the Army had felt differently. <laughs> and uh, so in night, now it's, I think it's going on, see, uh, let me think, 27 years, I have been the civilian aide to Secretary of the Army. It's on that card I gave you, I'll give you one of them. And uh, basically during that seven, 27 years, when I was appointed by this first President Bush, it was for three two-year terms, six years. And as I say, I'm on my 27th year. And so I've tried to quit. And I worked for five, I mean, for six secretaries of the armies. And <laughs> they said, Jim, no, we're gonna keep you around. Uh, you're, you're, you're emeritus, until you die, you're gonna be the civilian aid emeritus. And so, and he's, and when you're a civilian aide, you, do the things the secretary doesn't feel like he wants to do. Uh, like I was sent all over the world, and the first place I'd go is to meet uh, ambassadors, tell them why I was there in the country, like Bulgaria, or or Hungary, or uh, Austria, or Australia, or any place in the world. So I had a real interesting job uh, as civilian aide, and so it. As a matter of fact, I got a letter yesterday. <laughs> from a, a guy who's a good friend in Nebraska, and he sent me the stuff on a, a guy named Thayer, who is a general in Nebraska, and how the the uh, Veterans Administration or somebody put flags in, at uh, General Thayer's grave. But I just got it yesterday. I got to call him and thank him. But you get these wonderful, you know, at 95, getting those sort of things just changes your life. You know, that people really appreciate helping others and as I say at my age the only thing I want to do the rest of my life is help others next question um, so you said you were uh, in the reserves even during Vietnam yes uh, could you elaborate a little on that or like how how that was well in our case it was a little bit different because we were really we were not prepared to go to Vietnam we were prepared to go to Germany and see this before the Berlin Wall went down. This was in 1970 to 75. The wall didn't go down till 98, I think it was. 89. 90, yeah. So basically, we were still prepared to go to Germany, not to Vietnam. So uh, the only thing about Vietnam was that uh, it was, you saw the Ken Burns deal and tragic, tragic, tragic. Two guys from Oregon were against it. Wayne Morse, Senator Morse, and Senator Hatfield were against it. You know. So anyway, I, it's such a sad part in our military history that 
uh, some mistakes were made. I, I guess I shouldn't comment because I, I'm so negative on it. Okay, not very positive. Um, what did you did you do any other or did you have any other careers after you completely left? <laughs> well, well, I've been president of Port of Portland Commission. I've been president of Oregon Historical Society. <laughs> I've been, uh, I, I ran quality health care. I've been on the Reed College board for 20 years. I was on the General Telephone board 26 years, which is now Verizon. I was on the, when we changed from, uh, I was on that board for 26 years. I was on the Oregon Graduate Institute of Science and Technology board. And so you just kind of, I've just had the opportunity to serve. I think that's the main point I want to tell you. Uh, if you could work out that that you're not the important one, God has done it for you, so do it for others. Any objection to that? <laughs> any of the rest of you have any things that might be in the back of your mind? Put up your hand. I don't want to go. Yes? What would be the main difference from when you were 18 to what you can tell now that we're all becoming young adults? Listen, uh, Corey, give me give me a, one of those other copies of the scholarship deal. Get, they're, just get, get, just, uh, they're in here. Oh, they're in the deal. Yeah. Get, I want to I want to give one to both of you. I want to get your opinion on whether I should even mention it. I have four scholarships available. One to two. Mike, that one to hear. Take a look at that. Do you mind me just discussing this? No, no please. Because I, that's not the purpose of this. But I, I do have four scholarships every year. I can give a four-year scholarship to anybody that goes to an Oregon school or a Portland, a Portland State. No, no, University of Portland is the only non, and it's a four-year scholarship that people if they do it, would be uh, going to Oregon uh, National Guard afterwards. And I didn't want to bring that up because I didn't think it was, I, I wouldn't do it without your approval of even bringing it up. Now, sir, we honor the military, so that's absolutely appropriate for this group, sir. Well, anyway, that uh, particularly for seniors, and, uh, and so I, I have that opportunity if, uh, every year to point, uh, bring their general. Oh, that's one other thing. You're probably a little bit familiar, but they're also naming a museum for me. The Brigadier General J. B. Thayer Oregon Military Museum. And it's a relatively, it's all at Cramp with which is Clackamas. It's a $20 million project, and it's 95% done. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's a great honor. I didn't want it. I really fought it. God, I fought it. Because of, yes. Are you planning on going there when it's done? Huh? Are you planning on going there when it's done? Well, yeah, they want me to, but I just, I, and with my health, it's hard for me to go anyplace. I know I've got to do it because uh, to Tommy Thayer, I haven't mentioned him, but you've heard of the band Kiss. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's my son, and he's a, a tremendous individual, and he's kind of led the troops on raising money and he's been very, very successful. And um, I have four sons and they're all, I didn't mention, but John Thayer still has our company that Pat and I started with $5,000. And we started with, and this to show you what you can do with so little. Uh, first uh, day we did 40, 40, 40, $45. 45,000 the first year, 60,000, 80, 100 million, two million. And then when we got about 10 or 12 million, I sold it to three of my sons because they'd all work for me. And this is a, something you might think about your family, but uh, when they worked for me, they made enough money to go to college. And uh, basically uh, they, they do our business terrific. And the other formula I had, which is pretty good, uh, I put, I set aside one third of my life to education, one third to education, one third to work, and one third to retirement. I'm at a third third now.
So you heard about my education at Oregon and military and so on. So once I started J Thayer it was five thousand dollars, and I got up to at the end of my thirty years, he was big enough that I sold it to my sons, three of my sons, and then it just boomed. And today it's the third. It's, a, it's the largest private legal on the West Coast, J Thayer Company. The other son who is a uh, they, my baby, youngest, has a vineyard, Peace Mountain Vineyard, uh, south of here on Peace Mountain Road, and he's extremely successful. So I'm, uh, my, I haven't talked much about my wife, but my wife's the one that really has made me, because she, she's stuck with me with all the mistakes I made and so on. And so she's the one that, and she died about four years ago with, and she was here, she was in assisted living. But anyway, I've, I've had all these blessings and they keep coming. Have I said the right thing? Huh? We had to wrap it up. They have to be out of here at 11.35. What? They I, have to be out of here at 11.35. Yeah, well, we've got four, we got four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> now, I hope, I, I appreciate your attention and I hope that wasting your time driving clear from Yam Hill because, you know, Yam Hill has a lot of fame. You know, Kenny Jerns did the fly, Flying Tigers. Yeah, he went to... I've been looking forward to this day for like a month. Huh? Huh? I've been looking forward to this day for like a month. Yeah. Well, basically, it's just... And then there's so much history in regard to the stagecoach going from Yam Hill to Tillamook. You know, it's just all that great history in Yam Hill. And, of course, Carlton is more of a wine country now. And so uh, uh, I'm very proud that I had the opportunity to, get, to go to Carleton, and uh, they allowed me to have the theater here for an hour, and I hope you feel it's worth the time. What, what an honor to, uh, to meet you, sir, as a, as a general that you've done, but, but as, a, as a graduate of our high school, mm -hmm. of our, it's, just, it's just amazing, it's just really a great connection for these kids. Well, I think it shows that even though at a school of a hundred, high school of 125 in each class, mm -hmm. Uh, it was just a, it just, it fell into place. Mm -hmm. And I was a Baptist. I went from the time I was four until I went to college and then it was not convenient. My roommate was an Episcopalian. And uh, I've, I've been on three college boards, Reed College. I've been on Oregon Graduate, which is part of Oregon Health Science Center now. And then also the seminary at UC Berkeley, University of California, the Episcopal. So I've had the opportunity to be in to have the religious part, the business part, the religious part. Thank you for coming. Well, it's been an honor to be here. Uh, a couple things, uh, since you're from our area, we thought we'd bring you a shirt from our school. Oh, Tigers? Yep. There's, <laughs> the Tigers. Yeah. And so we'd like to get a couple pictures here if we could. Sure. Oh, this is great.